July. I hope you all enjoy the weekend um, as we uh, celebrate our independence uh, once again. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Paul talks about today is, in Romans is how in Christ we are, we are, uh, we are with him and we are uh, free from uh, death, eternal death, where we have eternal life. So uh, that's really cool. Um, uh, we, we, uh, today I'd ask you just to continue to pray uh, for St. Luke as we return to worship at nine o'clock. We, you know, the service, the service is, uh, you know, the service is taped. Um, so the nine is probably over by now, but I, I would hope you would pray and thank God that we're able to be together and pray as we, you know, continue worshiping uh, outside on the field at the 11 o'clock service as well as Wednesday night out on the field. Um, just one other thing I want to remind you if you decide to come Wednesday night or maybe the following Sunday you feel a little bit more comfortable or you're back from vacation, make sure you, you bring your own mask and bring your own chair. With that, let us begin the service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are open and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you with thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, read to us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now with our opening hymn, Before You, Lord, We Bow. Before You, Lord, We Bow.
Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare to you that I will restore to you double. The second reading is from Romans, the seventh chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Thus far the reading. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We pray our gospel acclamation. Alleluia, blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. You have revealed these things to infants. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of, the, of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hid these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We hear, we continue with our uh, sermon hymn. It's I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. So this morning we consider, we continue our sermon series in Romans, the sermon series that was um, prepared and uh, the text uh, by Dr. David Schmidt from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Um, so we get again, we give thanks for Pastor uh, Pat, Dr. Schmidt, Pastor Schmidt. Um, and this sermon series that he has put together for all of our churches in our synod. So, um, our, and the sermon will be based on our epistle lesson. 
Sometimes the smallest thing can tell a very great story. Your great grandmother's hope chest. Stone markings tell of Civil War battles. This is, I know, I, I, I don't know if I related to you this before, but um, Tina and my, my, either Jonathan or, or Ashley, my stepchildren, we like to take the dogs walking in a cemetery up in Stony Brook. It's a very old cemetery, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the history of Stony Brook in that whole North Shore community. You see the blighting birds and the nickels, and that's you know stones from the the 17 and the 1800s tombstones. So uh, the stone markers telling of the Civil War battles that show some of the people that were born in the 1800s that are buried there were veterans of the Civil War. So the smallest things can tell much greater stories, extending over time, involving many people. Consider a well-used silver cup about the size of a chalice that we use on Sunday morning for communion. It was buried in the homestead of one of the once prosperous Roman families. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, it was valuable enough to be buried in a wine cellar, but not valuable enough to be taken along as, a, as the family fled in safety. This one small cup belonging to one unnamed family told much of the larger story. The story of gods with a small g and humans. The story of Rome and what it was like to live under the rule of Caesar Augustus. On the one side of this cup is the image of Augustus surrounded by gods. He's seated and he's being handed the world by Venus and, and winged victory, while Mars, the god of war, brings before him a, multiple, a multitude of conquered nations. On the other side of the cup is the image of Augustus ruling over the people. Here the image is one of mercy and, and not of war. Augustus is seated, people are coming before him, and he extends one hand out to the people, while the other hand he holds a spear. The image of the emperor was common among, and was common throughout Rome at the time that when, uh, when Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. It was carved into marble friezes, printed on coins, molded into ceremonial cups like the one found in the Italian villa. It helped people to understand what it was like to be faithful. Faithfulness was the word used to describe the relationship between the conqueror and the conquered. The emperor held both power and mercy. In power, he would protect the people. You see him with a, a spear in his hand. In mercy, he would rule the people. So you see him reaching out with an open hand. Power and mercy in this one figure, ruling over people, one small actor in a much larger story of gods. When Paul wrote Romans, he offered another story of another conqueror who ruled over people in power and mercy. This God with a capital G and man was Jesus Christ. The small portion of the letter we have before us today is well known among us Lutherans. It names a struggle, the struggle between saint and sinner. The struggle is real and hidden in every heart of every person. Now some people confess this struggle openly, asking others to help them in relationships of accountability. And other people hide their struggle, putting on their, the best faces that they can. All people, however, suffer this struggle, and it's not something like that cup that can be left behind. Until the day when our conqueror, Jesus Christ, returns, we will be involved in the struggle of being a sinner and a saint. Paul's description is personal and individual. It tells the story of one man and one struggle that never seems to end. Paul knows the, the good that God desires, and Paul himself agrees with the desire. He acknowledges that what God wants is 
if he could. If Paul discovers that he's sold under sin. Paul uses the language of slavery and captivity. His members wage war and he, and he is captive to the law of sin. Paul knows the good that he wants to do, but he's unable to do it. Instead, he finds that what he doesn't want to do, that he does. A slave to sin, a captive to his flesh, Paul cries out for deliverance. His story is not the story of one man, however. This is the story that touches all people. Paul's cry is that of Cain, as in Cain and Abel. Knowing that God wants him to do, and yet also knowing that evil that is close at hand. Joseph's brothers, Jacob's son. Joseph, you know, the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, right? We've heard of that play. Joseph's brothers, knowing the good care and concern they should show their brother, and yet also knowing the evil judgment and the sale of Joseph into slavery that, he, that eventually overtakes them. David, King David, knowing the good rule of his kingdom and protection of his people that God desires, yet also knowing the evil pleasures of adultery and the murder that he could use to cover it up. From individuals to families to nations, this captivity continues through the ministry of Jesus. Peter, knowing the, the good that he wanted to do in following Jesus to death, yet knowing the evil that he does in denying his Lord in the courtyard. And to our lives today. Paul's one small story. This one small re revelation of his personal, private experience is the larger story and experience that we all know so well. This, however, is not the only story that Paul wants to tell us. In fact, there's a, a much greater story. The story of God that Paul wants to highlight for all people. This story of God is a story of faithfulness. Not our faithfulness, but God's faithfulness to his promises to his people, you and me. As early as the fall in the Garden of Eden, God had begun telling the story of his love. As Adam and Eve stood there naked before God, ashamed of themselves, and yet unable to hide, God began to speak of his love. They overheard it. In a conversation he had with the snake, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Here was the first glimpse of God's promise. The greatest story of God. He would send one, an offspring of woman, who would bruise the head of Satan and conquer in the fight. And Adam and Eve lived in hope. The individuals and families and the nations that followed them lived in hope of this story of God coming true. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to proclaim that it did come true. And it came true in Jesus Christ. Who will deliver me from this body of death, Paul cries out. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In this section of the letter, Paul lets his one small story become much the part of a much larger story. The story of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the one who came as our deliverer. We, we delivered him up to death as Satan worked through us to bruise his heel. And yet he delivered us from death and from the kingdom of Satan as he revealed his power in his resurrection and called us into the kingdom of God. This God who loves us, dies for us, and rises to give us new life. Jesus Christ is Lord, Paul proclaims, and with those words he invites everyone into God's greater story. 
Jesus is the one who rules, the one who is greater than Caesar and Caesar's gods. He himself is God. He has come as our deliverer, and he is at the heart of God's greater story of the rescue of his people from slavery and the redemption of all people in the world. An artist once captured this rule of Jesus in a painting. The painting is called Christ and the Four Evangelists, and it depicts Jesus as Salvador Mundi, the savior of the world. In 1560, Fra Bartolomeo engraved on either side of the cup, with one side telling the story of gods and one side telling the story of humans. Rather, he stands on top of the chalice, both God and man ruling over the world. His one arm holds a scepter with a globe on top. He truly holds all power and rule over creation. In his other hand, however, is raised in blessing. Through his death and resurrection, he has accomplished salvation for all people and now rules over all things in love and offers his blessing to the world. For some, this image has lost the intimacy of the silver cup of Augustus. There, Augustus was seated among people, extending his hand in mercy to them. Here, Christ is above the people. Even the evangelist appears small when compared with his higher and larger figure. His hand is raised, blessing, not extending to one, uh, not a blessing, not extending to one individual person in mercy. Dr. Schmidt said, if you look real closely at the image, you can see how Christ has chosen to rule over his people. The men who surround him are the evangelists who have written his message that is now being read to the world. They each hold their books, their gospels. The men in the back are looking at Jesus, while the ones in front are engaging the world. Matthew looks up at Jesus, and Mark points his finger toward Jesus while conversing with John. Luke stares out over the people who are gathered, and John points his finger downward. There we see two angels holding a disc, and that disc is just one place in the much larger world. When this picture was placed in, in the altar of a chapel, an amazing thing would happen. The priest facing the altar would lead worship, the worshiping community in communion. At this celebration of the Lord's Supper, the priest consecrated the host, and he would raise the host above his head, and there it would appear in that one small window on the world upheld by angels that the body of Christ is in the place where God's people meet Jesus. And that's why many times you see some of our pastors raise the host at the consecration. Yes, he has ascended to heaven. His left hand, excuse me, holds his scepter. He has powerful power and he rules over the world. His right hand is blessed over all. Yet the same Jesus is found among his people today. He is present with us, intimate and near, as he comes not only in his word, which we've been hearing week after week since this pandemic began, and he comes in his body and blood, the chalice and the host, to be your deliverer from sin, your savior. And I can't wait for July 19th, quite frankly, when we will be we'll once again be able to get together and celebrate the Lord's Supper. The evangelists proclaim this message. They want us to hear and have eyes to see this much larger story. Listen to the words of Matthew. Here in our gospel reading, Jesus invites you to see and come to him. Jesus says this. He declares this. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who are labor, lady, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Here, in a very tangible way, Jesus brings you once again to the heart of the greatest story of God. And when we gather for the Lord's Supper in just a couple of weeks, and whenever we gather for the Lord's Supper, we are connected to a, a much larger story of God's loving rule over us and his world. This is the story of Jesus, our deliverer, now coming among us. The one who rules the world, who has lifted his hand in eternal blessing, and we now, and we come, and we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. And yes, we come with our small private stories. The moments when we wanted to do good. We did not do, and the evil that we did didn't want to do, we did. That struggle is there. It's real. And we come today confessing our sins. But we also come trusting in his deliverance. Jesus is faithful. He remains faithful to his promise through his word. He remains faithful to his promise. Take, eat, drink. This is my body. This is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Our Lord rules. Jesus is our deliverer. In his hand is power and blessing here. And here we find mercy and in his word, we find mercy in his body and blood given and shed for you. And when we get together in a couple of weeks at the Lord's Supper, we are going to be joined to this much larger story. The story of God saving the world in Jesus. And as we lift that cup of salvation to the Lord, his power, his blessing, his mercy extend to us. And it continues to roll until the end of the world. Amen. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now continue our service as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free us from stagnant faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations, especially the United States and Canada, celebrating their nationhood. Guide leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building. Lead us to expansive love for our neighbor. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all those in need, all those who are tired, feeling despair, sick, 
or oppress, especially Kathy Sickles, Beth Kress, Hannah Freilich, Nico Marino, Rodney Schnabel, Julie Richardson, Madeline Tartaglia, Dolores Williams, Geraldine Rizzo, Wendy, De Debbie Rojas, Daniel Costa, Annie Wilkham, Dorlin Hewitt, Deborah Finlay, Charles Menino, Jenny Cavallo, Marion Kosman, Amandi Williams Wells, Vincent Papa, Richard Carlstrand, Trevor Torman, Walter Schaffner, Alguera, Alex Lynch, and Preston Ross. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this congregation. Bless pastors, deacons, and congregational leaders. Energize children's ministry volunteers, church administrators, and those who maintain our building. We also offer a prayer of thanks for our shepherd, Pastor Tom, who in this difficult time has sustained us with preaching the word, Bible study, and encouraging us as we go through this time. Shine in this place, Lord, that we might notice the ways of your love transforms our lives. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray also for new life, Lord. We give thanks for the birth of Asher William and Elias James Crawford, born on June 24th at 9.18 a.m. and 9.35 a.m. to Kathy and Pastor Jonathan Crawford, and, to, and for Alana Charlotte and Jesse Michael, born on June 30th at 6.11 p.m. and 9.42 p.m. to Eliza and Jesse Donahue. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our mercy. We give thanks for those who have died in the faith. Welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort us in our grief until we are joined with them in new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Once again, this is time for our, our stewardship where we would normally take our offering on Sunday morning. Uh, thank you, as I say, every time I get together with you, thank you so much for your, your gifts and tithes. Thank you so much for your talents and treasures that you've shared not only uh, with me, I thank, uh, I thank uh, uh, Deacon Eileen for praying for me today. Um, and I welcome her back. Uh, we're trying to get the deacons back in the swing of things, so I welcome back Eileen. Uh, thank you for the time, talent, and treasures for Jackie, and time, talent, and treasures for Janet, and Paul Elgert as he uh, he assists here on uh, trying to help you know get the back you know getting everything together on uh, for the service, uh, the recording, and all that. Um, so we thank them for that. Um, remember, you know, if you uh, you can continue to mail your ties in. Uh, I also recommend that you consider uh, uh, giving online. Uh, with that said. We continue uh, our service with the Lord's Prayer. Now we pray as our Lord and Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, receive the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.
Well, the only announcements I really have is again um, Wednesday, because you'll be seeing this on Sunday. Uh, the only announcements I really have is if you want, you can come Wednesday. If you're away this weekend, Fourth of July, come on down Wednesday for worship. It will be the very same worship service that you hear today, but you know you get to see some folks. That will be a contemporary worship service. We, Jackie got a, got the band back together. Uh, it's going to be you're part of the band. It's going to be Jackie, Mike Riccio, and uh, Peter Lamandola will be playing keyboards that night. Uh, and on Thursday night, we have a family fun night. It's at 4, 30. 4.30 and 7, and 7 o'clock. You can go on the church website and you have to register for that. And those will be safe um, distancing, safe, the whole safety thing will be, will be, uh, Jackie, are they going to wear masks when they come in? And yes. They have to wear masks when they come in. I guess when they go break out into the, the fun, uh, there, there won't be masks needed. I'm sure they're going to have to be keeping that six foot physical distancing. With that said, um, have a great Sunday. God's richest blessings to you today. And we close with um, our closing hymn, God of Our Fathers.